Okay, so chapter 14 has to do with the legal issues and the dental radiographer. Learning objectives for this chapter will be to define key terms associated with legal issues, list federal and state regulations affecting the use of dental x-ray equipment, and describe the general application of federal and state regulations relating to the dental auxiliary, to describe licensure requirements for exposing dental images, discuss risk management, and define the legal concept of informed consent, and to describe ways to obtain informed consent from a patient. We will discuss dental uh, malpractice issues, including negligence and standard of care, discuss the concept of statute of limitations and the legal significance of the dental record. We'll discuss how confidentiality laws affect the information of the dental record. We will describe the patient's rights with regards to the dental record, and then we'll describe the legal implications of patients who refuse to have dental x-ray images exposed. Okay, so why are we doing this? We need to discuss how those legal concepts, which include various regulations as they apply to the dental radiographer who exposed dental images for patient care. Basically, we need to talk about the legal concepts for the radiographer and for the regulations that involve the way we treat our patients. We need to address the issues of confidentiality and documentation. We need to understand not only the legal implications for the dentist, but also the legal implication for us as a dental auxiliary as well. Okay, so we need to talk about those legal issues and dental imaging. Laws exist that govern the use of ionizing radiation in dentistry. The federal and state regulations are the ones who govern that use of dental x-ray equipment. They also, there are also federal mandates that regulate who can and cannot take uh, radiographs, uh, what the proper training is, and what those certification standards are for dental auxiliaries who need to take radiographs. Uh, there is the possibility of negligent care exists when dental images are not properly exposed or used. So we're going to get into that a little bit more about what negligence is. But just know that taking either too many or not enough radiographs or not taking very good radiographs is uh, a grounds for negligent care. Okay, and of those legal issues in dental imaging, we're going to talk about federal and state regulations, and we're going to talk about licensure requirements. Okay, so we touched on it just a tiny bit in Chapter 6, but there is federal and state regulations which govern the use of dental x-ray machines that are made and sold in the United States. They also govern who can and cannot take radiographs. The... Um, Consumer Patient Radiation Health and Safety Act outlines requirements for the safe use of dental x-ray equipment. It also establishes guidelines for the proper maintenance of x-ray equipment and requires persons who perform dental imaging procedures to be properly trained and certified. There are also state, county, and city laws which mandate the regulation uh, for dental x-ray equipment and for the certification of dental radiographers. Um, you can find that, uh, I'm gonna link it on, on this week's lectures, that PDF for those regulations. And also you can always find updates on those kinds of things through the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners website, um, which we will talk about a bit more too. All dental x-ray machines sold in the US after it's at in 1974 have to meet those federal regulations. And typically those included the specifications for filtration, the accuracy of milliamperage and kilovoltage settings, things like that. A lot of states uh, require that those x-ray machines be registered and that charging a fee for that registration is reasonable. So there are uh, service representatives who come to dental offices. They charge the dentist a fee in order to maintain uh, and, and certify that dental uh, machine. And then most states require that that dental x-ray equipment be inspected about every five years. However, every state is different. So if you move away from Texas, you'll have to, you'll have to learn about their regulations as well. Okay, so those licensure requirements. Um, most of the time, in most cases, the dentist and the dental hygienist are not required to get additional certification in order to be able to take dental radiographs. The reason for that is because courses um, are involved for radiology, like my class, for instance, you have to pass my class in order to become a dental hygienist. And so in 
by becoming a dental hygienist, the licensure and the state board uh, automatically recognize that you would have passed this class, you would have learned about dental radiography, uh, at least to a certain degree in order to be able to safely treat your patients. And so there's no additional certification. However, for dental assistants, things are a little bit different because not every state requires that a dental assistant uh, be certified as a dental assistant. Some of them can uh, just be trained on the job. Texas is one of those states where you can do on the job training in order to become a dental assistant. And so you do have to have certification in order to take dental x-rays. If the dental assistant working in your office does not uh, either certified as a dental assistant, either like an RDA or uh, a CDA, then they must have that certification saying that they can take radiographs. The uh, Consumer Patient Radiation Health and Safety Act is that federal law that requires that the person who takes dental images be properly trained and certified. You'll probably see that one again. Um, every state deals with that a little bit differently. There is another state, uh, it's called Alabama, which doesn't require that the dental hygienist uh, be licensed um, specifically. And so there, Alabama is kind of its own little island over there <laughs> as far as dental hygiene goes. But those licensure requirements include obtaining that additional certification, uh, performing dental imaging procedures only under the direct supervision of the dentist, and then following restrictions concerning the types of dental images that may be legally exposed. And so just because you're dental, uh, because you're a dental hygienist and you're legally allowed to expose dental radiographs doesn't mean you could take a chest x-ray on someone. And so this is kind of where that gray area is. Uh, just because you're legally allowed to take a chest x-ray on someone does not then mean you can walk into a dentist's office and take dental radiographs. And so it's important to know the difference as far as what your certification entails. Ours entails taking dental radiographs. Um, also, you're only allowed to take it under the direct supervision of the dentist because every radiograph has to be individually prescribed for the patient. And so if the dentists weren't there, either through indirect or through general, then um, you, you wouldn't have a prescription to take that radiograph and you would not legally be allowed to do so. Okay, so some of those other legal issues we're going to be talking about will be risk management, malpractice issues, patient records, and the patients who refuse dental radiographs. Okay, so risk management is the policies and procedures that the office puts in place that should be followed by the dental radiographer to reduce the chances that a patient will file a legal action against the radiographer or the supervising dentist. So risk management policies are designed to reduce the likelihood that a malpractice lawsuit is taken up against the dentist. The dental radiographer has to be careful never to say anything negative about the x-ray equipment or how it is working. You you never want to say anything uh, demeaning about yourself as far as uh, whether or not you passed your class, whether or not you thought this class was difficult, things like that. You never want to give the patient ammunition against you um, and your office based on the things that you say. Statements that you make at the time of that negligent act are admissible as evidence in court. So when your patient uh, goes to his lawyer and he says, well, you know, the dental hygienist said that the, the tube had drifted and that's why the x-ray, like I had to take three x-rays because there was too much movement on my, my radiographs. I had to be, you know, uh, overly exposed. And so you don't want to give that kind of ammunition to your patient. Also involved in risk management is informed consent. And every single one of our patients has something called self-determinism. It means that they have the right to make choices about what kind of care they receive, about uh, they have the opportunity to learn about and either consent to having treatment or refuse to have that treatment. It is your dentist's responsibility to discuss the need for uh, images and the treatment procedures with your patient. Most of the time, it doesn't really happen that way. The dentist you know, uh, recommends a certain number of radiographs and then the radiographer goes and takes them. That's how it usually works. At our clinic at Concord, the dentist will recommend taking radiographs. Sometimes they'll go and talk to your patient about it um, and sometimes you'll tell your patient what the dentist um, had recommended and you'll talk to your patient about maybe why the dentist um, recommended that specific number or type 
whatever, you know, of radiographs. If you don't know why the dentist is recommending those x-rays specifically, you need to ask the dentist. Okay, and informed consent is probably one of the most important things you can learn about either in dental or in medical procedures. Uh, basic, th there's so much more to it as far as the legal ramifications of informed consent. But basically, the information that we have to give our patients in order for them to have informed consent or to be informed is why we want to take those radiographs, uh, what the benefits we see as happening in our professional opinions, the person who's going to take those images. And so if the dentist is saying that the assistant is going to take them or the hygienist is going to take them, then the patient who is sitting there needs to know who this person is and what their qualifications are, the number and type of images. So maybe, you know, you get uh, a consent for four bite wings, but you don't have consent for a pano, but you go ahead and take it anyway. That's not informed consent. We need to let them know how many x-rays we're going to be taking on them, how many radiographs we're going to be taking on them, sorry. And then the possible harm that would result if the images were not exposed. And so we need to let them know what would happen if we didn't take radiographs and we went ahead with treatment without them. They need to know the potential of what we could have missed. And then the risks associated with x-ray exposure. They need to understand that every uh, x-radiation exposure does cause some type of cellular damage. And, and that's important. Most of the time our patients are already pretty aware of this, but it is something that we still need to discuss with them. And then alternative diagnostic aids that may serve the same purpose as images. And so, you know, we might talk to them about, you know, having a clinical exam done in lieu of having radiographs, but what that difference there means. And so that's going to be important that we, that our patients have all of this information so that when they make their decision, they are making a good decision based on all of the facts and not just some of them. Um, just like patients have to consent to the other procedures that they have done, like a root canal or a crown or things like that, they have the opportunity to ask questions about those kinds of things. They also need to have informed consent when it comes to dental radiographs. Here in our clinic, we do take, uh, we have a form that you fill out where the patient has to sign and you have to sign saying that you explain to them what radiographs that were, were recommended for them, that they, uh, that they consent to it, and also so that they consent to pay for them as well in our in our clinic. Okay, we could probably have an entire course about what informed consent really means. And um, but for the purpose of this, we need to understand that informed consent is disclosing that information to our patient about all of those factors in exposing those dental images. Um, we need to do so in a way that the patients understand. So not every one of your patient is going to be a dental professional. And so if you're using the words like radiography and radiolucency and radiopacity, your patients may not understand those terms. And sometimes they don't ask questions when they don't understand whatever it is. So you need to give the information to your patient at the level that your patient can understand it. Um, dental radiographers should not, however, oversimplify that explanation. So we shouldn't just say, you know, oh, the, the radiographs are safe. We shouldn't say that, right, because they're not necessarily safe. We need to explain to them that there is a small amount of risk, but that the benefit outweighs that risk. And if your patient, you know, needs it simplified more than that, then you can simplify it more than that. But um, you still need to give them all of the information. Don't don't just give them part of it. Um Calling radiation harmful sometimes will make your patient uneasy, right? So you don't want to just say, oh, yeah, they're bad for you. You want to explain to your patient that there are a lot of things that are harmful for us um, in excess. And so, you know, too much food, um, too much water even can kill you, um, too much fluoride, too, too much of a lot of things is bad for you. And so we need to explain to our patients how the small amount of radiation that we would expose them to, while yes, if we expose them to way too much radiation, it would be bad for them. The small amount that we do expose them to isn't as bad for them. Um, and then informed consent is defined as the consent that's given by the patient after they have all of the facts. They need to know the purpose of the procedure, who performs it. They need to know the benefits of having that procedure. They need to know the possible risks of having the procedure. They also need to know the possible risks of not having the procedure. And they need to have the opportunity to ask questions. 
Um, informed consent isn't just a written or a verbal informed consent. Sometimes it can be considered implied consent. So maybe your patient comes in and sits down in your chair, and that can be construed as implied consent that your patient wants to have some type of exam done. Or, you know, if you say, okay, today we have you down for this procedure, and your patient, you know, opens their mouth, then that can be considered implied consent. You didn't ask them, you didn't make them do something. And so um, sometimes implied consent is, is a very gray area. You don't wanna rely on having implied consent when it's much better to have written informed consent. Um, but sometimes implied consent can kind of save your butt in some of these situations. Okay, so liability. That's what everybody wants to know. Who's held accountable? Legally, the dentists are held accountable and they are liable to supervise the performance of the dental auxiliaries. That means it's their job to make sure that the dental auxiliary is doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's their job to make sure we do our job. However, it's both of our jobs to do our jobs correctly. <laughs> and so both the dentist and the auxiliary can be sued for the actions of the dental auxiliary. It's, it's one of those things I definitely would never wanna be a dentist because you are responsible for everything that happens in your office, even if you didn't actually do it. And so um, typically things that the auxiliary is held accountable for are things that are done maliciously. Um, most of the time mistakes, honest mistakes, are not something that you would be held accountable for uh, because it is understandable that patients make mistakes, sorry. Um, and so, or that, that uh, radiographers make mistakes. And so it's, it's totally normal. Sometimes retakes happen, right? But if you are absolutely negligent in your care in that, you know, you're not, um, you're not trying to get good radiographs and so you're constantly having to take radiographs, you're not trying to become a better radiographer, then it would be considered negligent and that would be, that would be something malicious. Um, and it would also be malicious, you know, if you were just angry at your patient and so you took a bunch of radiographs on them. I, I don't see that happening, but, um, but just in case, just so you know, the word malicious is often used uh, when it comes to whether or not the dental auxiliary will be held accountable. Okay, so the next up is malpractice. Mal, it means bad, bad practice. So this results when the dental practitioner or the dental auxiliary or the dental radiographer is negligent in the delivery of dental care. And negligence is any time that you either do something wrong or you don't do something you're supposed to do. Um, negligence is when the diagnosis made or the dental treatment delivery falls below the standard of care. That's something that you're going to hear forever is the standard of care. And the standard of care is just basically the care that you're supposed to be providing, the care that you have the ability to provide in the area that you are providing care. So the standard of care may be in uh, San Antonio where you have digital x-rays available, you have you know, uh, intraoral cameras, you have all of this really high-tech equipment. That standard of care is gonna be vastly different than maybe if you went on a, um, one of those like dental mission trips and you went to a third world country and you were providing care um, to people out in the middle of, of Africa or something like that. That would be a very different care, right? You wouldn't be able to give them the same amount of, of treatment and the same you know options and things like that as you are to give people here in the US. Um, and so the standard of care varies depending on where you live, but the st whenever the standard of care isn't met, that is when you are held accountable. So if you know it's reasonable to take an FMX uh, series on your patient and you take those 18 radiographs, but you mess up 17 of them and you retake 17 of them, that would be considered negligent. That's not the standard of care. Um, it would be more likely that you might take you know those 18 radiographs and then you have to retake maybe two. That would be a, within the standard of care. That would be a normal amount. And so it's important to remember that negligence is not only not providing care, like when we think of neglect, we think of withholding care, um, but also it's negligence is when um, you're doing something that also falls below the standard of care. 
Oh, okay, it looks like I jumped the gun. Okay, so the next is the standard of care, and that's the quality of care that's provided by the practitioners in a similar locality under the same or similar conditions. And so you're, we're going to talk about it a lot in your entire program, the standard of care being, you know, the type of care that we provide to our patients and the quality of that care. And so, uh, so remember this standard of care and anytime you need to, to ask, is this something that I have to do or is it something that I should do? That's when we really need to bring out the standard of care. And the number of films that are exposed as well as the quality of the images are an important issue when we talk about that malpractice suit, that malpractice uh, issues. Malpractice, this word is typically only brought up when we talk about um, being sued. Uh, this is not something that happens very often. I don't want you to guys get to like freaked out that, you know, everything you do could be uh, potentially sued. Uh, most of the time, you know, nothing, nothing bad happens. Um, if, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you really have nothing to worry about. Um, you know, I, I practiced for five years and there was never a single issue as far as malpractice. And it's because I, you know, every single day I did what I was supposed to do, what I had to do, and I practiced at that standard of care. Okay, so another one of the things that we have to think about when we talk about malpractice um, and that legal, um, those lawsuits against the dental office, we have to talk about the statute of limitations and it's statute of limitations. I don't know why it bothers me when people say statute. Anyway, um, the statute of limitations is the time period during which the patient can bring up that malpractice action against the dentist or the dental auxiliary. It is the responsibility of the dentist to review and report all information presented on dental images and acquired data sets. So if the a malpractice action was taken against your office, it would be the dentist's responsibility to go get those records um, and present the case of, of his side or her side of what happened. Um, the statute of limitations really is all about time. And we always hear of statute of limitations whenever it comes to other types of crime, um, specifically like sexual harassment. We know that uh, there's, there's a very specific amount of time from the time of the assault until the time that the lawsuit is brought against the aggressor that, um, that we are able to prosecute that kind of thing. But the statute of limitations in a dental office functions a little bit differently because the law understands that patients don't know what's going on until a certain amount of time. So typically when you have work that's done that isn't good and it falls below that standard of care, it's negligent. We know that patients don't know that the, the work was bad, right? So if they got a filling um, that didn't get all of the decay out, then at the time of the filling, they don't know that it's a bad filling. Someone else who takes a radiograph might know, but the patient doesn't know. And so the law understands that. So the law says that the statute of limitations, when it functions inside of a dental practice, it happens, it starts, your time starts, not at the time the service was provided, but at the time that the patient would have reasonably been able to discover that the, the care was negligent. And so usually it's whenever that patient goes to another dentist and they have radiographs taken and the new dentist tells them about that care that, and say, okay, it looks like, uh, you know, that filling was bad, or it looks like, um, you know, they didn't, you have periodontal, you have severe periodontal disease. Did no one ever tell you? And you, the patient's like, I've been going to the same dentist for every six months for years. They've never said anything about periodontal disease. And so that would be the time where they transfer. That's when the time starts for a dental practice. The patient finds out that the care that they had received was bad because otherwise they have no idea. And then they have a certain amount of time, uh, depending on the state, to bring up an action up against that previous dentist. Um, typically, whenever a, uh, a practice uh, is sued, it's something that happened many years ago. And so you'll find in your day-to-day -day sort of life, you'll something will come up and you'll be like, oh man, like th that patient has severe periodontal disease. I told them all about it, but they refused care. Um, you know, let me write a, a book about how that patient had refused care. Um, 
And so things come up every single day in private practice or it, just in practice in general where you see something that you're like, oh, this could be a lawsuit if I don't do what I'm supposed to do. Right. And you think about it for probably a couple of days and then, you know, you, you see something else and you move on with your life. Um, it, it's not going to happen quickly. And so, you know, it's not something that typically it's not something that you even remember. It's something that happened years ago, 10 years ago. You don't remember that patient. You don't even remember their name. Um, and when the lawsuit happens, it's because that patient has finally transferred to a new dentist. They found out, you know, something else. And so now they come to you and they say, where are your records from, you know, 2002? And you're like, oh my goodness, like, do we even still have those records? Which we'll get into. But um, you just want to be mindful that that you take really good documentation. You guys are going to learn that in every every class, but every everything you do in a dental office you have to document so that you know 20 years from now when that patient finds out that you know something happened and they come to your office you're able to tell them what happened but anyway the statute of limitations is the amount of time from the time the patient discovers or should have reasonably discovered uh, that the care was negligent until the time that they can no longer uh, press charges against you. Uh, states govern that duration of time within which that uh, malpractice action can happen. And then, um, oh, I already told you, frequently it's when they seek care from someone else that they even find out that it was negligent. Okay, so this is the part everyone gets a little, oh my goodness, right? Because nobody wants to be sued. The patient record. And so in order to cover your butt on everything that you do, you have to document everything that you do. We're going to talk about the what is required for your x-rays um, and only those radiographs. Every other class you taught you you're in, you're going to talk about all the things that you have to document for all of the other services you provide. Uh, if you have questions on those, you can ask me. But for the purpose of this, we're only going to talk about what we have to do for our radiographs. And so the documentation must include informed consent, which we already went over. This is going to be a written and signed a uh, piece of paper that says we talked to the patient about what radiographs we were going to take and the patient agreed to take those radiographs and we already talked about all of the things that informed consent needs to have. Uh, we are going to write down the number and the type of images exposed. Now this is typically something that because the dentist is the one prescribing these radiographs then they are the ones who write this note. However, most of the time in private practice, you'll write the note and your dentist will review it and they'll agree to it. Uh, they might sign something uh, in your notes, but usually in private practice, this is something that you will write down and record. Um, here at Concord, the dentist will write his own separate note for the number and the type of images exposed. <clears throat> and then uh, the rationale for why those dental images were taken. Um, typically, the rationale is implied. It's the patient, uh, it's been, you know, five years since the patient came in, and so they, we were going to take an FMX because, you know, they're an adult, things like that. Those, those things are typically implied. However, if you were to have recommended taking four bite wings, and then on one of those bite wings, you saw an area that was suspicious, and so that led you to take maybe a panoramic x-ray, or it led you to take um, periapical x-rays, um, and the, you know, maybe you started with four bite wings, and then because you saw something, you took some PAs, and then because you saw something on those PAs, you took a pano. Um, and so it kind of led you down a whole radiographic uh, uh, trail, right? And so if, if that happened, then you need to write that rationale. You need to say, you know, the dentist prescribed four bite wings. However, then we were, saw, you know, a radiolucency on tooth number 14. And so then we took a PA of that area and we saw uh, an irregularity in the sinus. And so then we, we took a pano. Um, and so those are all things that we need to write in for changes to that prescription that we would have made. Um, and then the last one is the imaging report, which includes the diagnostic image information obtained from the interpretation of radiographs. This is something that typically happens inside the exam. And so um, you take your radiographs, your dentist look well, here at Concord, the dentist looks at them and then prescribes retakes, right, just based on those radiographs. And then um, later in the cleaning, you have the dentist come in and take or an, and do an exam. They look at the radiographs at the time of the exam, and they look at the patient's mouth, and they recommend treatment. Typically, that treatment that's recommended from both the clinical and the radiographic exam 
that is this part, okay? And so then um, either you record that information and have the dentist sign, or the dentist will record that information and they will sign. Um, the next thing is confidentiality. So state confidentiality laws protect this information. Um, this is a very, very big thing about confidentiality. Um, all of our radiographs do fall under HIPAA, which I don't know if you guys have talked about in other classes yet. It's one of those most important laws that govern how uh, medical and dental practices take care of our patient's information. And it is it is never okay to talk about uh, patient's personal information with someone who does not also treat that patient. What this means is you cannot talk about your patients in a way that would identify them to another student who is not seeing your patient. Um, this, is, this is one of those kinds of, of areas that sometimes it's hard because you wanna talk about what happened with your patient, but um, as far as giving information that could identify your patient, that is something that we cannot share with people who do not also treat your patients. Um, sometimes um, in those, uh, those non-diagnostic images, it's hard um, to not to get every radiograph perfect, right? You know, you don't you don't know what's in there until you start taking radiographs. And so, um, as far as like the number of X-rays that you take, um, taking retakes is something that you also need to include. I should have said that during that part. But um, the number and the type of images exposed aren't just the types of of radiographs that were prescribed for the patient. It's also those radiographs or the retakes as well. Um, it's really important to document those. Um, those radiographs because you do need to cover your butt against those malpractice issues. And then um, as far as that confidentiality law, your book talks about people who are privileged and people who are non-privileged. And this does has nothing to do with their socioeconomic status. Um, these are people who um, either they are treating the patient and so they are privileged to the information of that patient. So between you and your dentist, you're both privileged when you see your patients. Um, and then non-privileged people would be the front desk. So it's not okay to go up and talk smack about your patients to the front desk people unless it's something that has to do with their treatment, right? So if you and the dentist together are looking and you say, okay, this patient needs, um, you know, four quads of scaling, then it would be reasonable to go up and tell your front desk person because they're privileged to the fact that the patient needs that care because they have to put in the treatment and they have to, to do all of that. But it's not okay to go, you know, maybe to the dental assistant and tell them how they, your patient needed four quads of scaling, unless, you know, you needed their help of some kind. And so it's really important to remember that unless that person is helping you with the treatment, it's not okay to share information. Just like if your patient has, you know, maybe an STI or STD that they have, maybe, you know, maybe they have, um, herpes or something, and then you go up to the front desk and tell them about the herpes. That's that's not okay. We can't share that information with our front desk person. That's not going to affect um, the treatment that is being recommended in that moment, um, you know, unless it were like oral herpes and the patient has to, to be rescheduled or, or something like that. That you, you really need to be careful as far as who you're involving in the treatment of the patient. And you, you need to be aware of that because your patient is aware and they don't want you, you know, going around telling everybody they have herpes either. All right, now who owns the radiographs? This is also important. This is one of those very big legal issues that sometimes it's hard for your patient to understand. But legally, those images, the radiographs that you take, they belong to the dentist. He owns them or she owns them. And so patients, um, they don't own the radiographs. However, they have a right to be able to access those records. Okay, they are information about themselves. And so, what happens is if your your patient were to transfer to another office, the patient has the right to come to your office and say, I've transferred to a new office and I would like my uh, my records to be transferred to that office as well. And so that is reasonable. They should have access to that information in order to, the reason for this as far as radiographs go is because if you took x-rays on someone two, two weeks ago or two months ago, and now they're going to a new office, they should not have to go to that office and take new radiographs, right? Because that would be exposing our patients to too much uh, exposure, right? And so we want to, 
even if they're no longer our patient, we still want to reduce the amount of radiation that is exposed to them as much as we possibly can. Because even if they're not our patients, we still care about them and we still want the best for them. And so even if they're transferring, we still want to take care of them and make sure that we're reducing the amount of uh, radiation that they are exposed to. And so we would transfer those uh, images to the new dentist. However, if the radiographs that we took were maybe three years old, and it's not going to affect the amount of radiographs that the new dentist is going to have to take, that might not be something that we would transfer to the new dentist. And that's something that, that your dentist needs to decide and needs to make the decision on on an individual basis. If the radiographs that we took, you know, if we have 10 years worth of radiographs on that patient and now they're transferring to a new dentist, it's not reasonable that we would transfer all 10 years worth of radiographs over. It's only reasonable that we would transfer over only the x-rays or the radiographs that were taken um, that would be of use to the new dentist um, in in the sense that they would still be current not like you know being able to see a history anyway um, those dental records and the dental images do need to be retained indefinitely every state has different uh, laws about how long a radiograph needs to be retained. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but how long an office has to keep track of the record and how long the patient or the, the, the dentist needs to keep track of the radiographs. Sometimes those can be different. Maybe the dentist needs to keep track of the radiographs forever, but they don't have to keep track of the whole patient chart, like the notes that were written about that patient. And so um, every state is different depending on where you live. Um, some patients have trouble understanding that they don't own the images because typically either they or the insurance company paid for those radiographs, right? So they think that because they paid for it, they bought it and they own it, right? Um, and it's reasonable, that's a reasonable thing to think. Um, however, they bought um, the exam, they bought the knowledge that those radiographs uh, take, but as far as the, the image itself goes, they don't own that image. Um, it is reasonable to transfer them, um, with like we talked about, but it's also reasonable for the dentist to charge a fee for transferring those images because the dentist has to pay someone to, to make that transaction. And so, you know, they have to pay someone to either go look up those films in the patient's chart and make duplicates of those films and all, or, you know, maybe they're using digital at their office. And so then they have to pay someone, uh, typically it's the front desk person, to look up those images, to export those images into a, uh, an email that is, you know, privacy protected, and then to send those images to uh, the new dentist. Um, now, typically it's not recommended to give those radiographs to the patient. Um, it's more common to give those radiographs, it's, it's more, um, you know, kind of correct to give those radiographs to the other dentist. And the reason for that is the patient is, is not a dental professional. And so they're not able to, with a professional eye, look at those radiographs and really glean any information from it. Um, sometimes patients go on, you know, WebMD and they look up things and then they think they have a condition that they don't really have, but they're not licensed. They're not legally able to look at something and determine whether they have it, right? And so it's, 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 it also happens in, you know, the way that we write our things out in our notes. Um, you know, maybe we write, you know, there was a radiolucence on, on this area or something like that. And so, you know, they might take that as, as meaning something else because they don't, they don't understand. They don't have training in this field. And so it's important to remember that, that we don't give it to the patient because we don't want them to misunderstand or misinterpret the information that we give them because they're not trained on dental you know terminology they're not trained to look at radiographs and so we don't want to give them something and then they freak out because they think that they have a condition that maybe they don't or we don't want them to take it and see it and and you know we wrote in our notes that they have a condition and they look at the radiographs they don't know and so then they think they don't and they think we don't know what we're talking about and so it's just a good idea to give our radiographs to uh, the new dentist who's going to be able to look at them from a professional uh, opinion and be able to uh, accurately diagnose and understand and, and, and know what the heck they're looking at. Okay, so this is one of those areas where everybody gets a little uncomfortable.
And it's now the patient is also uncomfortable, right, when they're refusing x-rays. <laughs> um, but anytime a patient refuses exposure to dental images is kind of an area where things get a little, they get a little uncomfortable, they get a little anxious. And so the situation has to be very carefully considered by the dentist. The dentist has to decide whether that accurate diagnosis can be made and whether treatment can be provided based on a lack of radiographic um, evidence, okay? So when a dentist is looking at a patient, they're not only using x-rays to determine, they're also using that clinical, that view of inside the patient's mouth in order to be able to provide uh, an accurate diagnosis and to be able to, to then, based on that diagnosis, provide treatment. Um, the dentist should never work without a current image of the problem area. The reason for that is you don't know, just by looking at the area, what is happening beneath the gum tissue and beneath the bone. We don't know what's happening inside that tooth without that radiographic image. And so anytime a patient refuses x-ray images, they need to understand that the risk from radiation is very small compared to the risk of working without that image. They need to understand that um, what they would be getting in radiation would be much smaller than the benefit that they would get from you know having that radiograph and being able to accurately diagnose um, the use of images is now accepted as the standard of care so this like we talked about earlier the standard of care is that we take radiographs of all of the areas that we are looking at, which is the entire mouth, and we use those images in order to provide an accurate diagnosis. If we don't take radiographs, we are providing substandard care. We are not providing care at the standard. And so what that typically means is that we cannot provide treatment. That's it, we can't provide treatment. If the patient wants us to give them negligent care, then that's on us to tell them that's negligent, we can't do that. And if you still refuse x-rays, and that's okay, it's their right to refuse x-rays, but we also have the right to refuse to treat them. And sometimes people get a little uncomfortable with this. Um, now, it is also important for the dentist to look at the whole picture. They need to look at the patient's history. They need to look at their dental history. You know, maybe that patient comes in and the dentist has recommended taking um, an FMX on them every four years, um, you know, maybe based on social history or things like that. The patient comes in four years later and they haven't had any problems in four years. And so then they want to refuse to take radiographs or they maybe they just they don't want to refuse uh, forever, they just want to refuse this time. Maybe they're strapped for cash or, or you know, whatever happens, the patient wants to put off taking radiographs. The dentist then needs to make the decision, do I want to see this patient without those radiographs? Do I want to roll that dice and take that chance on treating this patient the way that um, I can without them? Or do I want to refuse my patient to even be seen at all? And Sometimes in some in some cases, you know, we might be providing treatment for that patient um, better than if they were to go somewhere else and be re and be refused. So is are you know are we doing no harm? Are we providing treatment and things like that? And that's we are going to get into that in law and ethics. But we always have to weigh that balance of are we harming our patient by not taking radiographs or are we benefiting them because we are still seeing them without the radiographs. And that's that's something that the dentist has to really look at. As far as you go, as far as the, the dental hygienist, this radiographs is something that the dentist prescribes. And the dentist is the one who needs who's who's going to be held accountable for seeing that patient without radiographs. However, it's your job to document as well. And so if your patient comes in, they refuse radiographs, and your dentist says, you know what, we're going to go ahead and see them. Go ahead and do a profi on them. It's, it's your job to document what happened. And so you'll write dentist 
you know, said it was okay. Um, you know, the patient refused radiographs. Uh, the dentist was the one who said we were going to be doing a prophy. Um, and you need to be very clear in your notes as far as who said what and, and why you did what you did. So that later down the road, if something were to come up and the patient says, you know, I had periodontal disease, why did they do just a regular cleaning on me or a regular prophy on me? when they should have been doing uh, scaling and root planning. And then you can go back and say, well, it looks like you refused x-rays at that appointment and the dentist told me to do a prophy. Now this is where things get a little uncomfortable because you are also responsible for looking at radiographs and providing treatment and you have the dental, uh, you, you know, you're a dental professional. And so you're also responsible for the care that you provide and so, while yes, the dentist is the one who prescribes radiographs, and yes, the dentist is the one who can, who is the only one who can diagnose periodontal disease, um, you most likely won't be held liable. Um, most likely you won't be held accountable. Unless, you know, in your periodontal assessment, you were going around and getting, you know, very deep probing depths, you were getting, you know, sixes and sevens in your probing depths, and now you know something's going on, right? In your clinical assessment, you were able to determine this patient does not need a prophy. They need scaling and root planning, but I don't have radiographs and the dentist told me to do a prophy. That's the kind of red flag that needs to pop up for you that says, okay, now I'm done. Okay. And, and, and maybe you lose your license or, you know, not your license, but maybe you lose your job over it. You know, if you go head to head with your dentist and you say, I'm getting sixes and sevens, that patient needs radiographs in order for us to be able to see what's happening with their bone, because I'm not doing a prophy on that patient. That patient does not need a prophy. You know, you, that, that's where you take that risk of either your dentist listens to you and says, okay, yes, because of the clinical uh, evaluation and your periodontal evaluation, um, it looks like without radiographs, we can't continue treatment. And so then the patient gets to decide, oh, okay, they found something, but do I want to take radiographs? Um, and, and this is all very gray. Every single time it happens, it's, it's an area where, you know, you're uncomfortable the whole time. Um, but every, every step of the way is a decision for someone. And so the patient comes in, you know, you give them the x-rays, they get to accept or refuse. The dentist then gets to accept or refuse. And then you do an evaluation, you get to accept or refuse. Everybody gets to make a decision at some point in this chain. And it's important for you to document everyone's decision and it's important for you to make the right decision when it's your decision to make and so I want you to keep in mind that while yes the dentist is the one who prescribes dental images and yes the dentist is the one who uh, diagnoses periodontal disease you are still a dental professional and you still have um, you know the uh, professional opinion to make and to decide your part in all of this and 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 don't let them snowball you or or you know make you do things that you feel uncomfortable with because your license would also be on the line in that case if you if you knew that patient had sixes and eights millimeter pockets and you continue to do a prophy on them that is the part where it it's gone from uh just the dentist's negligence and now it is your negligence okay Oh man, I feel like this one is an area where you have a lot of questions and it's an area where we all feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> but uh, if you have questions as far as the information that the book has given you, um, I definitely want you to put those in the question and answer. And then if you have uh, any individual questions, things like that, you can always bring them up in lab um, or you can send me an email, just like always.